old. We have been faithful to this course, and here we are. My name is Dr. Kuranira Kaugiri from Kenyatta National Hospital. I'll hand over to our, uh, the chair of our session, Dr. Lois, to start us off and introduce the panelists as we start. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Thiranira. You've truly kept us on course over the last one year. So good morning, everybody. Um, host, I need to start my video. Uh, sorry, I'm complaining that I can't start my video. My apologies. Uh, good morning, everyone, and many thanks for joining. Um, uh, I think a number of people are joining. We've started a few minutes late. We needed to wait for the panelists to join in. Uh, but thank you. Most of them have now joined. We have one person who will be joining us uh, in um, a few minutes. So today is an interesting day. I'm not sure when bad thing happens. Do you say it's an anniversary? I don't know what to call. I'm not sure this is an anniversary. It's a not pleasant place to be one year down the road. I almost wish one year down the road was in January when cases were so few. But this one year down the road is being marked at a time when cases are going up. And these are some of the things we will discuss as we go on. We are very privileged today to have with us a number of panelists. Uh, first, we have with us the Director General, um, uh, Dr. Patrick Amot. Dr. Amot, we are very grateful that you are able to make time. We appreciate how busy your schedule is. Thank you so much for joining us. I think all the healthcare workers are excited to hear from you and potentially ask a few questions. Uh, Dr. Amot may not manage to stay throughout the session, so we'll uh, encourage that if you have questions, you can post them and we'll pick a few that he will be able to answer before he leaves. Uh, we're also very privileged to have with us uh, Linus Kaikai, who is a journalist that we all know so well uh, with Citizen TV. He's also, um, he's also the chair of the, uh, of the the editors guild yes <laughs> thank you Thiranira. and uh i think it's we have partnered so closely with the media during the last one year and they have been so instrumental probably the most important uh, part of this uh response in terms of informing people in terms of highlighting what was important and i think it was really important that you're able to talk together and say where are we going to from here what are some of the lessons learned around reporting uh, in the context of a pandemic and how do we move on with the lessons that are learned uh, we also have with us Professor Gola. Uh, I think we all know Professor Gola because he's a teacher, a mentor to many of us. Um, Prof has been a very faithful attendee of this webinar from the time we started last year, but today he's here on a slightly different footing and to talk about his experience um, battling with COVID at some point last year. And we're really, really honored, Prof, that uh, you even agreed to join and to share your experience. Uh, later on, we'll be joined by Dr. Mbai. Dr. Mbai is the chair of the CEC's Health, CEC's Health, and he'll be talking to us about where the counties are. I think we've always had questions about what the counties are doing and how prepared they are to handle. Uh, also with us is Dr. Maybeth Maritin, and we'll be talking about some of the questions around the COVID vaccine. There are so many questions at this point and so much um, is appearing in social media and probably just try and put to rest some of the concerns that we have. So as you can see, very excited and very interesting uh, session we have today. Uh, we will start off with uh, Dr. Amot. Dr. Amot Karibu Sana. Uh, I will give you now the opportunity to speak. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lois, for the opportunity. And I uh, welcome everybody for this important webinar. I think today marks a great milestone in our fight against the pandemic. I think today is the 12th of um, March 2021, exactly one year when we recorded our first case. Uh, we have made significant gains, but we also we have had uh, significant challenges in how to address the pandemic. And I think this is coming at a very important time now that we are dealing with the third wave of the pandemic but also in a good space now that we have started administration of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, I think the war is not yet won. We need to continue the journey with the measures that we have put in place and ensure all Kenyans, uh, we work together as one people for us to successfully vanquish the enemy. I uh, thank you.
Okay. Uh, Dr. Mark, are you trying to share presentation? I don't know whether it has been shared with you. Can somebody be able to load it from your side or I have to do it from my side? Uh, it hasn't been shared with me yet. I can try and get it. If you are able to uh -huh. load it, that would be useful. The share screen button just at the bottom of your screen. I have it, Dr. Amos. I'm going to share it in a minute. Uh, open. Hmm? Oh. Is it or no? And then, no, let's go back to the rest of it. Yeah, so this is just a slide showing us the overview of the response strategy, looking at the whole uh, one nation, uh, uh, one people approach. Uh, if you look at the left side of the slide, uh, starting from protecting the vulnerable population, the measures that I'm in put in place. Uh, then next is to, uh, to rebuild the economy, enforce the public health measures, and then build health system capacity to be able to respond to the surge in number of cases and enforce social distance compliance measures. Next. So the strategic interventions are now, this is what I picked from the previous slide, Enfor enforcement of the public health measures was to protect the healthcare workers by implementing a testing regime, effective contact tracing, the quarantine interventions that we put in place and to enforce widespread use of masks in uh, both public and private spaces. And the inf interventions implemented included public communication to the assistance, citizens on engagement on COVID-19, enforcement of infection prevention control measures, and a provision of a dedicated toll line, 719. Of course, the mandatory screening in ports of entry and in all public places, and provision of PPEs to healthcare workers to ensure that they are protected from getting the infection. Then we went ahead in the initial phase of the pandemic, fumigation and disinfection of public uh, spaces. And once the airspace was closed, we enforced mandatory quarantine of suspected cases and testing, targeted testing of persons in quarantine spaces. Of course, the contact tracing and the isolation of confirmed cases and of importance was the uh, establishment of a psychosocial support system. This went uh, further even to uh, a bit of telepsych uh, counseling. And of course, we developed various protocols for the transport sector, the interfaith council. Next. Uh, the the next strategy was to build the health system capacity and the aim of this was to flatten the curve. Uh, and this was geared towards increasing the number of hostel beds, isolation facilities, quarantine facilities, uh, additional healthcare workers and additional supplies, including ICU capacity, PPEs, beds, ventilators, and portable oxygen. The interventions impl implemented under this uh, stream included activation of the Public Health Emergency Operations Center, which has continued to collect the information which we churn out every day. Uh, mobilization, mapping and deployment of ambulances, 
with the support of the World Bank, we, uh, we brought up on board Red Cross to be able to support us, especially in areas which were recording high cases of COVID-19, scaling up of our testing capacity uh, by engaging both the public and the private sector, building capacity for healthcare workers to be able to manage the cases and respond appropriately. And also the uh, modeling consortium to be able to inform decision-making in terms of the po policy imperatives going forward to stem the rise in the number of cases. Uh, of course, enhanced surveillance and reporting system, which initially was manual, then we went to an, into a, dig a digital platform and uh, building extra infrastructure uh, in the public health and also in the private uh, our health facilities. Uh, as of now, we had an additional, we moved the ICU beds from 115 to 319, and the isolation centers have a, an additional capacity of more than 11,000. And we believe this platform going forward will be a good uh, space for us to tackle us towards achievement of UHC. Uh, we, of course, also recruited uh, additional healthcare workers on a contract basis. Next. Uh, enforcement of social distance compliance measures was imperative to be able to break the chain of transmission and the interventions uh, uh, that were implemented in this phase included closure of learning institutions in the month of March, the uh, nationwide dusk to dawn curfew, which continues to date. Of course, the learning institutions have opened and so far it has worked very well. In the next few days, we are going into the exa examination period and we hope it will hold so that we can be able to complete the examinations without any interruption. Uh, then there was the initial uh, restriction of movement in identified hotspots. This affected mainly Nairobi and Mombasa. Uh, there was the, also the closure of the places of worship, the eateries and entertainment spots. Thereafter, of course, we developed uh, protocols to ensure that these spaces were open, but with strict measures in place to stop further transmission. Uh, the, one of the biggest challenges, of course, has been the ban in the gatherings, especially polit political gatherings and roadside events. This continues to be a challenge, especially in terms of en enforcement. Uh, also, physical distancing in public spaces and PSVs, initially this was well adhered to, but with fatigue setting in, we have also encountered challenges, but also issues of equity, because like now when SGR started operating at full capacity, airlines started flying and were allowed to have full capacity, the PSVs also raised up came up in arms and said that they can also be able to ensure the physical distancing and the infection prevention control measures, and they should also be allowed to operate at full capacity. The work from home measures, this one especially has been well, well implemented, especially by the private sector. Turanira has hijacked my presentation. Sorry, we are trying to sort it out some internet problem. But you're okay. sorting it out in a second. We'll be putting up the presentation, Dr. Amos, shortly. Just give, okay. give us like 30 seconds. Thank you. Okay. Actually, it's back. Thank you. And continue. Thanks for that. Uh, next, I think I'm done with that slide. Uh, then the protection of the vulnerable, knowing then the particular population that was vulnerable to severe COVID infection. The aim was to address the needs of vulnerable groups with measures such as nutrition assistance programs and temporary ev eviction moratoriums and eligibility for food assistance programs. 
interventions in implemented under this facet was the development and implementation of guidelines to embed nutrition security to support vulnerable households. This one was especially implemented in the informal settlements. Uh, distribution of food to flood affected households. We did this for people in Western Kenya and uh, Nyanza province. Distribution of reusable face masks to households in informal settlements. Again, the private sector played an, a crucial role. Also other philanthropists who came to be able to give donations. And then there was a weekly cash, cash transfer of 1,000 shillings to the identified vulnerable households. This was done electronically through M-Pesa. And we also centralized the distribution of in-kind dona donations by well-wishers to vulnerable households. This uh, centralization was to ensure accountability for the donations that were received. And through the support of the Ministry of uh, Water and Irrigation, free water and sanitation facilities in informal settlements. And you also worked with uh, uh, some CBOs, community-based organizations, to ensure that this was implemented. Next. Uh, where are we as of today? Globally, the disease burden as at uh, today, uh, one, close to 118 million cases reported more than 2.86 deaths reported, global case fatality of 2.2%. As uh, that uh, today, more than 300 million vaccine doses have been administered, of course. Majority of vaccine administration have taken place in the high income countries, but the low and middle income countries have already started vaccination, quite a number of countries like in the East African region, we have started, Uganda has started, Rwanda has started in the western part of Africa, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Angola in the south, of course, South Africa. And I think uh, progress is being made. In Africa, confirmed cases are now close to 3 million, uh, more than 74,000 deaths reported. African case fatality rate, of course, is slightly higher than global average because of our fragile health system. The Kenyan case load as of yesterday, more than 1.3 million tests conducted, more than 111,000 cases reported, but uh, reasonable recovery rates of more than 80%. Uh, closed 1,900 deaths reported so far, but our case fatality rate is lower than the global average and all 47 countries have reported COVID-19 cases. Next. In terms of laboratory testing, and this is key because now as the vaccines come into place, of course, we need to continue to implement other non-pharmaceutical interventions. So far, we have a total of 47, 46 laboratories 30 of which are public health laboratories, majority of which are based in Cambridge, and uh, 16 are in the private sector approved to do PCR testing. Currently, as uh, we speak, there's no backlog of samples in any of the laboratories. Uh, we, expand, we plan to expand testing to more counties. Uh, we are getting an additional uh, 17 PCR machines at the end of this month, out of a total of 28 counties. And we have prioritized counties based on need to be able to see, receive these uh, PCR machines. And therefore going forward, we think that we can be able to achieve our optimal testing capacity of one per thousand population. We have developed guidelines for antigen testing uh, in terms of who needs to be tested, the testing algorithm, how we are going to share the data and how we interpret the data. Cambridge Welcome Trust Kilik is a designated regional reference center for genomic sequencing for the Eastern African region covering, of course, uh, South Sudan, covering Djibouti, covering Tanzania. Uh, I think we also cover Rwanda. And this uh, center has uh, generated important uh, data for policy implication. I think as at uh, mid-February, uh, Cameroon Welcome had done about 58 genomic sequencing, and we are able to pick 
four cases of the South African variant and one case of the UK variant. Also, the Kemri Walter Reed lab in Kisumu has also done an additional 346 sequencing because they have higher capacity. We did this for Batuk, the troops from UK, and we picked, I think, 46 uh, of the UK variant. But when we did the sequencing for the local population, we didn't pick any. So because that was a military installation, it was possible to quickly move in and quarantine the entire installation and prevent further spread into the local population. Under the One Health platform, because people's health and animal health and the ecosystem is closely interrelated, we are working with ILRI, International Livestock Research Institute, to support us in genomic sequencing. And I think we are going to get our first uh, sequencing results from ILRI next week on Monday or Tuesday. This work is ongoing to be able to monitor the various trends uh, that are emerging. Next. Uh, the impact of these uh, NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions, the interventions that slowed down cases tremendously from a possible close to 137,000 by 21st of June last year to, to close to 29,000 as at 20th of June that period. Sustaining some of these interventions also reduced the overall possible cases by about 30,000, 30% from a potential 136,000 uh, to uh, 96,000 by 31st December of last year. Had these interventions been maintained, the reduction would have been more than 45%, with cases likely to have remained below 84,000, meaning the impact of the interventions would have been greater. But of course, there was also serious push for lifting of most of the interventions, one because of fatigue, but because also of political pressure. Next. Uh, the preventing interventions at the time slow down the fatalities. If you look at the case fatality from a possible 2,500 and possibly higher, given the health system could not, could be overwhelmed by 21st of June, 2020 to just 125 at that time. And the sustained interventions reduced the overall possible fatalities by more than 45% to 1670 by 31st of December last year. Again, this impact was a little suppressed by the experience of the second wave, which peaked around November, December. And the second wave was more serious than the first wave because we opened up the space and there was also movement of people to the, to the rural areas where a significant proportion of the population had been, not been exposed and therefore vulnerable to uh, uh, getting the infection. Uh, so today, the death stand at about 1900. Had some, some of these interventions not been sustained through the second wave, the projected facility, fatalities would have risen to around uh, 3,000, close to 3,500 by 9th of March. And the deaths averted so far under all the prevailing circumstances stand at 1,544, which is equivalent to 45% fatalities averted. Next. In the worst case scenarios without any interventions, the overwhelming cases and peak would have come much sooner. And by 20th of April, it would have averaged at about 12,000 cases per day. And the existing health capacity would have been overrun by within just about one month of reporting of the first case. And between 13th and 6th of May, there would have been more than 60,000 cases who would have required hospitalization and would have not had capacity to be able to hold this number of patients and would have reported about 6,000 deaths as a result of lack of care. And of course, increased case fatality rate of more than 10% due to strain in the health system. Next.
Uh, the way forward, and this is what we discussed in the National Emergency Response Committee, and not to preempt what is Excellency the President is going to announce today. Uh, one of the interventions uh, going forward was strict. One of the weaknesses we have had is in terms of enforce, uh, enforcement of the interventions that we have continued to articulate. So we propose strict enforcement of the ban on all forms of gatherings and crowding, especially political and roadside gatherings. We have just come from a heated by election in the western part of the country and also in the central part of the country around uh, Nakuru. Uh, we also intend to have all social governance to remain suspended except funerals and burials and weddings that will remain capped at a, a maximum of 50 persons. We believe that these political gatherings have contributed to the emerging third wave that we are witnessing. Uh, we need to maintain strict uh, enforcement of public health social measures, including the hand washing, it's soap and water, the sanitizers, uh, physical distancing in public, in private places, and proper masking. Uh, in our discussion with Interfaith Council, and they, are very, they have been very supportive ensure that they continue to enforce the guidelines in place for places of worship to comply with the public health measures to curtail the transmission. Uh, stricter enforcement of border health security, especially with our southern neighbors. Uh, we have gone ahead to be able to provide additional capacity in terms of human resource, all the way from uh, uh, Kuala, down Lunga Lunga, all the way to Isabania. We have also provided additional testing capacity in form of rap rapid kits to be able to ensure that anybody coming from uh, our neighbors in the South uh, are tested before they are granted entry into Kenyan uh, border. Next. I, is that my last? I think that is my last slide. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Amos. I'll ask my co-panelists here to unmute themselves and clap for you. <laughs> this is your first presentation now. So uh, thank, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think we're very honored that you're able to make this presentation. And I think you've helped to answer a lot of questions some of which you are going to ask. And I think one of the questions was going to be around the issue of variance. You've seen such a large explosion in number of cases after a significant lull. And of course, the question that has been in everyone's mind is, could this be because of, of having variance with faster transmission? And I think that's an answer that will come as more and more uh, surveillance for the various genotypes goes on. Um, there's uh, still the question around, as we are putting together all these other preventive measures. We've noticed recently the issue of flights into the country. I don't know what your thoughts are around uh, quarantine of travelers into the country, uh, whether that is something that's worth pursuing or not, especially at a time when different countries are reporting variants. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Dr. Amot, unmute your mic. Dr. Amot, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. So, sorry, I didn't get that. Oh, so there was uh, one of the questions was, uh, I mean, you answered partly around the issue of variants. We've seen a yeah. recent large explosion in number of cases. And the question around, is it just because you're having more rapid transmission or what could be going on? And when we talk about variants, uh, we may not know where we are right now as capacity is built, but what about flights into the country in addition to all these other preventive measures? Is that something that you should be concerned about, about um, in reintroducing quarantine for travelers into the country? 
We have started introducing quarantine measures for travelers in the, into the country. Uh, like last week, I think we introduced quarantine measures for uh, Spain, for Kuwait. I can't remember, there are about five, six countries. But also this is a very delicate matter, uh, which has a lot of political undertones. And sometimes it is done without science behind it. We have tried to articulate the scientific aspect of it, but of course, in terms of uh, uh, restricting, rest, rest, uh, imposing flight bans, that decision has to be made at the very top level of the government. So we are looking into that, but we are also looking into this uh, resurgence in number of cases and in terms of the variants, as you have clearly articulated. Uh, one of the challenges we have had is, of course, is limited sequencing capacity that was available in Kilifi, which could only be able to do less than 50 sequences per week. The capacity in Western Kenya at um, Walter Reed is slightly higher, and that is why we are also in discussion with Ilri, who are using a more modern technology, the next gen generation sequencing. Uh, this will be able to give us a capacity of more than 200 sequencing uh, samples per week. Uh, we don't know for sure whether the resurgence is because of variants, but uh, like this week, we have had a discussion with KU, where KU teaching hospital, where some patients presented with unique manifestations. We went ahead to pick those specimens, and these ones are the ones that we submitted to Ilri and we hope to get the results by Monday or Tuesday next week. So everything is still on the table. Part of the advisory is about, of course, ban. But again, ours is to give technical advice. The eventual decision rests with the political class. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amos. I, I see there are a lot of questions around the vaccine. Some of the questions around vaccine efficacy and safety we'll handle a little later. But you are our patient one. We cheered and watched as you got your vaccine. Uh, I think everybody has been asking, what, what, what are you feeling? And what would you like to urge people, especially healthcare workers, regarding the vaccine? Thanks, Lois. I'm feeling good. The only thing I experienced was soreness at the injection site, which disappeared within uh, 24, 48 hours. I didn't experience any other thing. And I've been feeling good since then. I think my advice to healthcare workers is that the vaccine has undergone a rigorous and robust uh, uh, trial. And I think when the time comes for vaccination, all of them should troop to the vaccination centers to be able to get their vaccine, because this is an additional tool for us to be able to stem the transmission of this virus so that we can go back to normal or near normal. Thank you very much, Dr. Amos, for joining us this morning. I think some of the questions we'll handle as we go on. Uh, we know you're busy, and we thank you for giving us a sneak peek into today's announcement. Uh, and uh, we, we welcome you to stay to the end if you're able to, uh, but allow us to move on to, uh, we have uh, three other speakers, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Amos. Yeah, I will leave at 11 uh, because I have another meeting. Okay, all right, thank you. So now I'm very happy to invite uh, Dr. Mbai. Dr. Mbai is the chair of the CC uh, Health, and uh, it's very good that you could join us. We've had many questions over time around where counties are, how prepared counties are, and now as we get into a wave uh, that seems to be progressing very rapidly, the questions of how are counties placed to manage severe uh, illness. So Dr. Mbai, karibu sana. Thanks. Um, um, I, I don't know whether you guys can hear me. Good morning. Good morning. We can hear you loud and clear. Hello? Uh, Dr. Can Mbai, we can hear you very well. Yes. We Hello? can hear you. you oh, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Mbai. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I have seen uh, Turanera has uh, displayed my presentation. It's a very short presentation, but uh, giving um, 
an overview of um, the milestones that the counties have made as far as management of COVID-19 is concerned. And um, um, without wasting time, let me go quickly to the achievements that county governments, county have, made. governments have made. on. One of the things that we must um, um, thank the national government and Dr. Amol's team is that um, they have continuously given the counties information, directions, and um, areas of policy where we really need to work together to make sure that COVID is managed well. And all the 47 counties um, established county emergency, emergency response committees. And um, these committees were actually comprising of um, the CEC as the chair and um, the, the, the county commissioner as the co-chair. And uh, we, we had um, also membership in the, in the county health management teams, the director and the chief officer. And we also had faith-based um, representatives. And we also had um, in charge of police, the county commander, because um, we realized that for, for us to be able to, to manage um, properly, we had to involve everyone. So we were able actually to do the same even at sub county levels. And we, we enhanced our surveillance systems to strengthen um, the, the, the community aspect of, of um, making sure that they are aware of what COVID is and how they need to manage it. Eh? So all county government supported the national government in comprehensive dissemination and implementation of guidelines, regulations, and protocols developed by MOH. Some of the guidelines that counties upheld included closure of places of worship, a restriction of movement, closure of all schools, matatu, and um, COVID-19 adherence and advocacy on mandatory masking up. And in this, we developed some quarantine centers. For example, in our place, we had two quarantines where we used to arrest people who are going against those rules. Uh, county governments also enforced county specific measures after the case of national lockdown, including increasing testing of county border points installing uh, um, hand washing facilities in bus stops and closing down crowded marketplaces among many. Uh, one of them um, actually to do fumigation. A lot of counties did a lot of fumigation. Uh, we were able to, sorry, there was an interference there. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, then um, we we successfully also rolled out uh, home-based interventions, and um, we were able to make sure that um, the cost of running the facilities. you are losing me. The cost of running the facilities was um, costly owing to the large numbers of suspected cases through contact tracing. So the, the protocols of home-based were very instrumental in reducing the numbers of suspected cases in the quarantine facilities and um, advocating for home care. Again, next, the county governments increased their COVID-19 bed capacities to 300 beds and more. Um, a total of um, a total of 13,828 beds across the county governments were made. That two counties, as listed below, achieved the presidential directive to increase the bed capacity in COVID-19 facilities to a 300 bed threshold. Eh? I'm not going to read them. You can just see them. Um, county governments also increased their ICU bed capacity and increased the number of ventilators. For example, in Muranga County, we did a um, 21-day ICU, and um, um, progressively we have been increasing the number of uh, beds. And right now, we can uh, positively say that we have 35 bed um, 
ICU in Muranga County. Right now we have uh, two patients who are also um, COVID positive and are in the ICU. Then uh, currently um, across the 47 counties, there are 480 ICU beds and 457 ventilators. These achievements are attributed to county initiative and support from development partners. Oh, oops. That's not there. Um, counties which did not have ICU facilities, such as Samburu, Marsabit, Siaya, and, and Kirinyaga, now have the facilities. In collaboration with MOH, um, County governments have built capacity of more than 91,979 um, CHW and 65,708 CHVs. The Ministry of Health and Partners supporting counties have continuously trained on infection prevention and control. Community health promotion up through the pandemic. Sorry, I don't know. Well, um, the Ministry of Health and Partners, suspecting counties, have continuously trained on infection prevention and control, and community health promotion uh, uh, all through the, the the pandemic. Then um, we've also strengthened the. Um, local manufacturing industries in the county governments, um, especially in uh, preparation of um, masks. County governments collaborated with MOH and supported local industries in the, in the manufacture and procurement of PPEs. For example, Kitui County and Nakuru County um, learning institutions such as uh, Kenyatta University, University of Nairobi and JQuart have also raised um, to the occasions through interventions of ventilators and ICU beds for the counties. Now with support from partners such as UNDP and USAID, county governments recruited additional human resources for health to ease the workload in um, the facilities. A total of 6,680 healthcare workers were recruited between March and April to provide for COVID-19 patients. An additional 9,858 were recruited by end of uh, July 2020. Although this recruitment was short term, the human resource world have also assisted in ensuring continuity of essential services. At this juncture, I must say that even for me in Moranga County, I received 20 staff for ICU support. County governments, we allocated their financial allocation and uh, channeled money towards um, uh, combating COVID-19. A total of Kenya shilling 6.2 billion towards COVID-19 response. For the financial year 2019-2020, Kenya shillings 5 billion, conditional grants through MOH, in addition support for the partners, either on cash or non-cash support also came to the counties. Next. Continuity of essential health services. Uh, although there was um, a reduction in the numbers of people seeking essential health services due to the factors associated with the pandemic, uh, the increased number of positive uh, healthcare workers due to effect delivery of service, both on um, essential health services and COVID-19 response. I think that um, well, that that was um, seen uh, across the counties. Where, for example, for us in Muranga, I had uh, seventy-seven staff gotten affected, and I lost two nurses of COVID nineteen. Challenges that counties faced uh, quite a number. There was inadequate testing capacities across the counties. Delays in delaying the test results at the border and, test, and to tested contacts affecting 
the process of management of the pandemic. I remember some cases used to take even a week before we get results. So that was a very, very big challenge. Then inadequate PPEs to serve uh, all the frontline healthcare workers. I think in Muranga for this journey happened the first three months and then after that we were okay. And then um, there was restriction measures interfered with community of um, essential services uh, because of uh, fear of uh, mixing the COVID-19 cases with patients who are, uh, didn't, did not have it. Um, is that the last slide, Turanira? Yes, it is, Wazir. Yeah, so just okay. to add on, on, on the side of the challenges is the, um, when we were doing reinforcement, we also got some challenges uh, because of the coordination of the, um, of, of the national police. Um, uh, sometimes we, we would do some arrests and we find that um, when we go to the, to the quarantine areas, um, we, we had to spend some money to make sure that the facilities run. And um, that aspect of financing the, 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 the coordinating team I, was, was a real challenge uh, for us. Then um, the other challenge is that uh, when we were doing um, surveillance and contact tracing, we found some people would, um, when, when we go testing them, they would give the wrong numbers. And then when it comes to contact tracing, you find they are nowhere to be found. So thank you very much. I think that's all I need to say. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mbai, for a very clear sort of um, summary of what the counties have done. And we really appreciate the amount of work counties have done in this response. And this is our clap for you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for joining in today. I think the, um, and we also appreciate that you, you've come into chairing the CEC caucus at a time when, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and really wishing you well as you start this process. Um, one of the things that we've noted over time, and it's something that will be very key for you, is that counties often gave very good reports of where they were at, but when it came to the practical on the ground, a patient has to be taken care of. Then those ventilators were not connected, the oxygen was not flowing, the ICU was not available. And I just wonder how you're going to ensure that these are not good reports, but they're actually practically happening on the ground. Uh, okay, well, one of the things we, we agreed when we met uh, as a caucus of the CECs is that um, we really need to make sure that uh, all the equipments that have been put in place for management of COVID-19 are working. And um, if you look at the counties that have actually ha um, installed those IC equipment, the ventilators, the monitors, it will, we agree that it will make no sense if you have such and they are not working. So for example, for us in Muranga County, our ICU is working. I have already said that I have two patients of COVID uh, positive, uh, that are already admitted right now. And I've started seeing some surge of um, cases also coming. I have um, four in isolation that have tested positive and I have seven home-based. And we have agreed as a caucus that um, the CECs need to take charge and, and, and make sure that their facilities are functional. Because this is not about it, uh, um, which county is doing best. It's about, it's about um, delivery of service. Because I, I, I can come to Nairobi today and if I get sick when I'm there, I will have to be taken to a hospital in Nairobi. So that, that one we have agreed. And I think all the CCs are up to the challenge. Okay. Uh, th that is really encouraging. As you're aware, many times over the last few months, a lot of patients have been referred to Nairobi. Now, hospitals in Nairobi are full, ICUs are full. So we can no longer support counties in terms of patient care. So uh, we're really glad that uh, each of the C's, C's will take that. I think what's really crucial is ensuring that each county has a functional critical care unit that is available for management of patients with COVID-19. That uh, we appreciate like many of our facilities, once the cases went down, the healthcare workers were redeployed, some of the units were closed. And because now we're seeing cases rapidly going up, we have to encourage every facility to open their units 
and ensure they have healthcare workers there. So we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, a few may, questions may come in uh, as we continue and we'll come back to you on and off to ask some of those questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbai. Um, allow me now in to uh, invite me. Professor Ogola. Um, sorry, just one second. Yes, yes, Dr. Mbai. Any other question for me? Uh, not currently. Okay, fine, no problem. Then we can continue. Thank you so much. Um, so allow me to bring Professor Gola in. Professor Gola, you're there? Yes, Liza, I'm, I'm there. Been listening okay. patiently. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe we could just start off by giving us uh, briefly uh, some of your recent experiences. Fine. Okay. Thanks, Lois, for inviting me to this. As you know, I had a little bit of hesitancy, but then I said probably this has got some value in demystifying the, the, the illness and also giving hope to other healthcare workers. Uh, my experience is uh, like all of us as healthcare workers, our rational side is, of course, conscious of the fact that we could get infected. Can you hear me? Yes. Prof, we have lost you for a yeah, minute don't... there. Sorry? Sorry, we lost you for a minute there. Oh, OK. Because my side sounds OK unless they're okay. So I was saying that um, as, as human beings, you know, our rational side, of course, is cognizant of the fact that we are all at risk of this infection. And, uh, hello? We can hear you well. Okay. Uh, but, uh, and also that as healthcare workers, we are at higher risk. But somehow, you know, you just, you, you don't quite believe that it will get to it. So how did my experience start? Uh, this was sometime in mid-December. Uh, I'd gone up country, the Mount Kenya region for a funeral over a weekend. I came by arms in the department. And I remember me having a chat with Lois specifically about some students who are examining. Then later that day, I started feeling about, you know, general malaise, query fever and all that. Uh, you try to, you know, be optimistic and say, maybe this is just fatigue. I, I'm sure that sounds very familiar. And so I slept over it. Uh, that night, the next morning, which was a Wednesday, I had a class, which I did at eight, then was in a meeting. But then during later during the day, I said, yeah, I think I'm actually getting sick. So to cut a long story short, the next day, which was a Thursday, I saw one of my colleagues and we ran a number of tests including doing the COVID swab. So almost all the other tests were basically okay, you know, the inflammatory markers were fine, the blood count, <clears throat> renal function, d dimer blah, 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 blah. So the next morning, which was a Friday, again, some of these things you remember very vividly, I get a call from the nurse in charge of uh, infection, infection control, at Nairobi Hostel System Boogie, and she says, Professor Gola, how are you? And then, you know, she starts asking me questions like where I've been. So, of course, I told her, come on, sister, cut, cut that crap off. Just tell me, is my COVID positive? So she said, yes, it is positive, so fine. So at that time, I had a chat with uh, my colleagues and because I wasn't particularly sick, I had no respiratory symptoms, I had no dyspnea. 
it was just the fever. So we sort of agreed that uh, um, I could manage myself from home, monitor my temperature, monitor my clinical signs, and critically, of course, monitor my saturations. Now, so that was Friday. And then sort of things started going down southwards. Incidentally, as Lois will remember, I never really developed cough for any of those things, but the fever persisted. I got increasingly weak. Uh, my appetite was really, really, really bad. So after about four or five days or so, because I remember I got into hostel on 23rd of December, which was you know two days before Christmas, it was a Wednesday. So by that time, between my discussions and the family and Lois, who was my primary physician, we agreed that uh, I got to hospital and, and got admitted. I uh, was in hostel for about 15 days, about half of that period in the ICU. And, uh, and finally got discharged, I think it was the 7th of January. So I think that's probably the initial bit, maybe others will come as I answer more questions. Yes, Lois, back to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, even for just sharing that experience. Um, I guess one of the questions I had for you is around uh, your management, your treatment. What did you take when you were at home? That's one. And when you're in hospital, on this forum, we've often talked about the controversies of different treatments. And many times when you're not the patient, it's very easy to say, no, don't do this one. This has no evidence. But when you're the one who's faced with the issue, um, how was it in terms of figuring out and discussing the different treatments available and even the decisions around what to use or what not to use? Oh, you may need to unmute. Mm -hmm. Prof. Yeah. Uh, Prof, did you fall off? Oh, okay. I think, uh, uh, wow, Prof's line has fallen off. So we will try to get him back and continue with the discussion. In the meantime, as we get him back, I think we will move on to the next presentation. Um, sorry. So our next presentation is from Linus Kaikai. Sorry, I'd made a little mistake when I was introducing him um, earlier. So I will just correct that now. So Linus was the, I think the immediate former chair of the editors, um, of the editors guild. And now he is the um, Director of Strategy and Innovation at Citizen. Um, so sorry about that, but we are still happy to have Chair of the Editors Guild with us. So Linus, Karibu Sana. Um, I know you probably sent me your presentation and maybe you can just start as I try to pull it up. Mm, I don't know if it's managed to send. Have you managed to send me your presentation? Uh, Linus, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'll just mute it. Yeah, uh, you have the representation uh, on your uh, email. Uh, inbox. I'm just trying to open it. Okay. You can tell us a story as we open it. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I want to start by saying thank you. And it's such a pleasure to be. Uh, in the midst of uh, such a very vast um, uh, webinar of, of, of people of different expertise and uh, such a sad topic, I must say, uh, on my end at a personal front, COVID-19 hit us, not just professionally, but at a personal fr uh, front. I lost my elder brother, who was the county attorney of uh, Kajado, COVID-19, in August uh, last year. So I went through the motions 
um, of seeing what the frontier of treatment looks like uh, from the time it is confirmed that uh, someone is COVID-19 positive to the moving to uh, the Kenyatta University uh, referral, which um, at the time, and I think even now is still regarded as the main uh, COVID specialized uh, unit. Uh, so for me, COVID of course comes uh, with some very, very difficult uh, personal uh, memories. Let me go now to the newsroom as we wait to um, get the presentation. Uh, sorry, Linus, it hasn't arrived. Okay. Is it Are possible you able to share it? From here, let me just see. I can do it from here. Have you been able to, are you able to share it? Lina? Uh, Linus, are you able to hear me? Uh, yeah, yes, I'm able to hear you. I'm just trying to send it to your inbox again. Okay, all right. Yeah, can I share a story before Linus comes on board? Uh, yes, Dr. Mbai, please go ahead. You can take maybe a minute or two as we try to share the slides. Yes, um, I just wanted to tell the panel that um, even me in November, uh, I got COVID and um, I was um, the first the first day I vomited badly. It was um, that, you know, that projectile vomiting that you you feel like the ribs are coming off. Then um, after one day, I lost my taste and smell. Then I went to the hospital and um, I was given azithromycin, some vitamin C, some zinc tablets that I was told to take for four days. And on, on um, the, the, I, I used to feel uh, very tired, uh, joint pains, but on the seventh, The, the test did not come back until after 15 days, the taste and the smell. So maybe that, that, that's an experience that's um, worth sharing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbai. And I wonder, uh, did the other symptoms come after since November when you got well? Have you had any new symptoms or any persisting symptoms other than the taste? Um, the, the 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 symptoms that um i could say that were very um grilling were, was um the loss of taste the loss of smell and the um general um tiredness you you feel very tired all over and then uh, when when i when i got to sleep like on the fourth day when i went to sleep at some point i felt like i couldn't breathe then i stood and went to the window and then I felt now I can breathe. And then um, I was afraid because, you know, everybody is afraid to die. Yeah? So that particular night, I did not sleep. I was like, I was feeling like if I sleep, uh, death will find me in the sleep. So Dr. I did not sleep. Every time when I tell my governor this, he laughs so much, but that was the truth.
Dr. Mbajo, check if it's in. So it's an experience that... Uh, Yes, yes. I, I have received this, Linus. Uh, I'll just be opening to share in a minute. So that was it, Dr. Lois. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbai, and thank you for sharing that experience. As healthcare workers, sometimes we don't share enough. And uh, just by this sharing, I think we've encouraged a lot of people just to know that they will be okay. So thank you so much, even for sharing uh, your experience. Thank you. So Linus, I'm just opening a presentation. I'll be sharing it in one second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Mm. okay, there, there you go. Okay, th thank you very much. Let let's go to the second slide. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, in Kenya, COVID-19 became a big media secret. In newsrooms, we do not get to know what the statistics are. Do we know today, for example, how many reporters were affected or infected during the last one year? We do not have those numbers. And the simple reason is fear of stigma for two things. The first one is personal, and then the second one is on the business front. I think just like most businesses in Kenya, media was very, very hesitant to go out and say, oh, we have 10, 20 infections in the newsroom because of the sense of panic that will bring and the, and the, and the stigma that, is, that, that attends uh, to that. So that's the only explanation I could give to the fact that we do not have those statistics in public when it comes to uh, newsroom cases, uh, the, the people affected in newsrooms and media houses. Next slide. Yet the global figures uh, in the next slide tell us a very uh, painful story. Over 600 journalists have died between, uh, died between March 1st and December 31st last year. The majority of those were in Latin America uh, followed by uh, Asia, which had 145 journalists, 94 died in Europe, 28 died in Africa. And uh, the source of that is Emblem campaign, a campaign in uh, Geneva. They tell us, they have given us those figures as at last December. Next uh, slide. What has the pandemic done to Kenyan media? I'll first go to what it has meant in terms of operations of the media. One, it has depleted newsrooms because newsrooms have to play safe. So it means that you have uh, a reduced um, staff resource because you have to keep people in a shift system that can allow you to go on and keep, in, uh, keep your operations running in case of infections. So what we've done and this is across uh, the media industries, we have divided um, our staff into shifts that are completely separate. You do not allow them to mix. Um, and this, of course, was assuming the worst case scenario in which an entire shift gets uh, infected. What will happen to broadcasts? What will happen to uh, news gathering and news broadcasts? And that's why we came up with a, a shift system that really depleted the workforce in the industry. Uh, we've also embraced technology, uh, Zoom, Google, and uh, studios at home, and entire departments such as commercial department, marketing departments, who are really uh, asked to work from home. Only the newsroom, the people who gather news and who must go out there in the field and bring it to the, to the station for processing are the only ones that were retained in uh, the physical space of most media houses. Next slide. Then there is the personal impact. The personal impact ranges from trauma for the field teams. Um, when you deploy 
deploy them especially to hospitals or uh, in the early stages to uh, places where the contact tracing teams were moving. It, it was a traumatic experience because, they, because of fear of sickness. Uh, journalists, a majority of them are normally not fearful, but uh, when it comes to disease, pandemics, uh, this is not a war. It is something else that we fear it more than we do fear uh, frontline. Then simple things like uh, becoming hostages of sanitizers and health prof, uh, protocols uh, from the ministry. And uh, uh, this, thing, this made everything that we use uh, quite unsafe from tripods that we use for, ca for carrying cameras, the cameras themselves, the bags, the whole field operation becomes a risk. It's exposure. You can get infected just by the simple act of going out and doing what you are supposed to do as a journalist. Then interaction. Uh, apart from ending newsroom meetings, um, journalism is a contact sport. You talk to your sources, you have to reach where they are. You interview them at close range. That had to change too. Uh, you may have seen uh, introduction of long boom microphones, just so that the distance is maintained between a reporter and a source of news. Um, these are things that we never, we used to uh, uh, only deploy for um, entertainment shows. Now they had to come into the news operations, longer microphone uh, stands uh, so that we can take care of the social distance aspect. Next slide. The business impact. We've seen decline in advertising. It's, uh, it, it's rather uh, clear um, that the last one year since, uh, has seen the media suffering a lot in decline of uh, advertising. Uh, the entertainment industry, which media relies on also, um, basically collapsed because you don't have road shows, you don't have um, big field events and all that, and that affected uh, revenues in the media. What that translated to immediately is massive layoffs across the industry, but we also had um, salary cuts, which remain in force in most media houses to date. Just so that you can keep the operations going, and retain some staff to do that, but you, we had to do that by um, slashing their salaries. Uh, in terms of percentages, between 10 and 40% uh, is what I know that uh, a lot of media houses did implement. How did we navigate? Next slide. We navigated this by, first of all, saying lives first. And this was not. Uh, a normal journalistic mantra because uh, journalism takes reporters even to the war fronts and uh, you know as much as you are told to keep safe uh, you are also encouraged to be courageous now when it comes to COVID-19 courage found no place you can't ask a journalist to be courageous to cover a pandemic uh, so we had one mantra this time and we said live lives first no story is greater than your life don't expose yourself and that's why we went to remote journalism. Um, you may have noticed right through the last one year that um, we now bring cameras to your homes uh, for interviews instead of inviting you over to our studios. And then internally, we've had to go for counseling support because this had quite a lot of impact on the psychological um, side of things for journalists, especially those who have been to places that were traumatizing. Uh, especially hospitals. Next slide. There are things that also changed massively about how media handles stories. Because for the first time, media was confronted uh, with a challenge of complex health science issues. So the need to understand the statistics and the mathematics of the pandemic became very, very critical. Um, it just meant that media has to, media people have to work harder. When you get those statistics from the Ministry of Health, you have to be able to know how to interpret that, the percentages, the base and all that. So interacting with the complex, com complex issues that are arising from the pandemic uh, also changed how newsrooms uh, work. Now, textbook science versus frontier science. 
the pandemic really presented us with the frontier science, science as it is practiced. So we had to also adjust very, very quickly as media. And how we also did this was to try and get reporters to specialize in um, in this in, in in health reporting, we had some reporters who we gave more access and interaction with the health experts, just so that we build their capacity and ability to report on those uh, issues. We are also seeing now in the era of the vaccine, the vaccine that has been rolled out, that the uncertainty of science is meeting journalistic skepticism. Remember, journalists always question things first of all by doubting them doubting the veracity of those uh, things and one of the things that right now is under the microscope is the efficiency efficacy of the of the vaccine that is uh, making rounds so it's a very very interesting space you will see a lot of interviews coming through either in print or broadcast um, spaces where journalists will be raising questions uh, on very simple things that would include Tell us about the side effects of this um, of, of, of this um, vaccine. We had some stories uh, coming out of the Scandinavian countries about the negative side effects of uh, of the vaccine, and this is what I say. Uh, I mean, when I say that uh, uncertainty of science is meeting journalistic journalistic uh, skepticism. Next slide. The COVID-19 story has been unprecedented. And so what it has also required is uh, uh, us as media to check on what the World uh, Health Organization is calling infodemic, that is misinformation. Because rich research has been uh, fast-tracked, uh, mis misinformation has been very, very uh, likely. So for media, the pressure has been the need to know the facts and the need to know the science, just so that you reduce the chances of uh, misinformation. What this has required is a collaboration between journalists and researchers and medical practitioners. And this is where a lot of you have come through for media in terms of those interviews that enlighten um, the audiences on what is going on uh, with the different aspects of the pandemic. Our big worry now as media is what about the next pandemic. We just hope we have another 100 years after COVID-19. Thank you very much, I want to stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Linus. We are hoping right there with you that we'll also have another 100 years before the next pandemic. And it's interesting that you say uh, journalists thought life first. I remember in the initial stages, journalists coming and saying they want to go into the COVID unit. And I thought these people are so brave. <laughs> They're not afraid of COVID because they wanted to go right there. And I guess one of the questions that I have for you, and you sort of alluded to this towards the end, is the issue around the infodemic. Uh, many times, you know, there's so much, COVID has brought in so many pseudo experts and everybody wants to say something everybody wants to be heard to have said something social media is awash with all manner of conspiracy theories and everything is blown out of proportion how do you uh, navigate that space so that you don't add on to the fear but help to calm people so to speak thank you dr lois um, the need for collaboration cannot be um, overemphasized here because first of all, journalists are not experts when it comes to what is at hand right now. We have very, very few uh, journalists who have uh, um, um, public health or medical background. And so how we've been navigating and how we should continue navigating is a close collaboration uh, between media and uh, researchers and medical practitioners and health authorities as well. Um, it has to be uh, approached that way, where authorities, qualified authorities, those who are very, very clearly respected when it comes to certain issues, 
um, come to the fore, use the media, use the platform to um, make clear those um, positions. I want to give an example. Just recently, we ran a story of an old lady who had lost her husband to COVID-19. She is in her 80s and she was saying, I'm not going to take the job. And uh, we asked her why. And she said, because the Catholic church has not told me I can do that. If they do, uh, then I will, um, I will take the, the vaccine. Uh, this tells us something about the place of deeply seated beliefs, because that's where the misinformation starts. Because where is the link between the Catholic church teachings and the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, which some of which are just months new. Obviously, this is coming from a historic uh, kind of trend where the faithful rely on, say, the church on medical issues. Remember, the vaccination um, issues with the Catholic church are not new. So here is a lady who, based on what she believed in the past, placed the COVID-19 vaccine right in the same place as other previous debates in the Catholic Church, whether it's about, um, um, about vaccines or, or, or about uh, family planning methods. So it needs a collaboration. Journalists cannot do this alone. They need to seed the, the platform to experts to do it uh, using the media platforms. Uh, thank you so very much. And I think that issue of collaboration is important. Many times, even as healthcare workers, we shy away from speaking to the media. So the issue of that's the only way when we work together to get the right information out to people cannot be overstated. Uh, we are very honored that you are able to join us today. And we hope that you can continue to work together uh, as we navigate this season that is unprecedented. So thank you so much for joining us, Lina. Okay, so allow me to bring back uh, Professor Gola. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay, terrible. Uh, Professor Gola, unfortunately, there was a small technical hitch, but he's now joined us again. Prof, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. My, my apologies. Uh, I'm yeah. doing this from home, and uh, my safari from home fiber is misbehaving, but I hope we'll be able to finish now. Okay, thank you so much uh, for joining again. So I think the question I'd asked just before that um, your connection broke was around uh, issues around treatment. I mean, one of the things that you talked about in this forum over and over was, you know, all the controversies around treatment, what to take at home, and when you are in hospital, you know, the decisions around what to get, what treatment to get, and how some of those decisions were made. Yeah, thanks. In, in fact, you know, I went through the whole process explaining everything. Kumbe, I was talking to myself. So essentially, I think to summarize it is one, I let, despite the fact that generally I'm a very opinionated guy, I, I let my healthcare workers uh, take the decisions and I did what they said. I remember when I was being discharged, Lois telling me that she was surprised I was such a good patient. But I think the important thing is that I was lucky in a sense that uh, uh, because I had my own opinions about what is right and what is not right. I mean, what has been studied and proven and, and what has not been proven. And uh, I think my I was fortunate in the sense that I was having a healthcare team that was headed by Lois, with whom we shared many uh, opinions. And therefore, at no point in time was there discordance. I wanted something which they didn't think was right, or they wanted to give me something which I did think was right. So in that sense, I was lucky. And one of the things that I said before, when I got disconnected is that, but it brings, a concept that I think it is, is important for we as healthcare workers to in, internalize. I was fortunate that I was a senior healthcare worker dealing with colleagues and therefore we could discuss. But the whole concept of shared decision making is extremely important in modern medicine. And I think we, this is something that we have to 
inculcate into our minds as, as healthcare workers, that patients have got opinions, however misguided, that they have values, and that we don't have any powers to impose interventions on them, and that we must always discuss with the patient, with the family, uh, and, and, and agree on a compromise, the, the, the whole concept of shared decision making. I must say that in my particular circumstances, it worked very well, uh, maybe because of, of, of who I am. But yeah, so Lois, that is my that 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 is my response. I did exactly what you told me. <laughs> I think thank you very much, Prof. And I'll have to tell people this now because we are managing a senior cardiologist. If we had a question about blood pressure. We didn't wonder what to do. We went and said, so Prof, what do you think we should do about blood pressure? And was educating us about his care in the process. So we were learning from him while we were taking care of him. Uh, but maybe then the other question is, after your discharge, what are some of the challenges that you've had? Are there any lingering symptoms? Are there any new symptoms? How did you manage some of the lingering issues post discharge? Thanks, Lois. Maybe before I, I go to that, maybe just two issues I want to highlight that relate more probably to the inpatient setting than post-discharge. And one is that uh, COVID is a very, very lonely disease. And that we as healthcare uh, we should be covered. You have muted, that. Prof. Okay. Yeah, it's, this is the problem of using the phone every time a, a, a call comes. So, uh, so every we as healthcare workers should be aware of that fact and and and, and offer whatever substitute it can't take care of people seeing their family and their loved ones and all that. I mean, you get admitted, you are isolated. The healthcare workers who come to see you are, of course, in the hazmat suits and, and the goggles and all that, so you can't see their faces. So unless it is somebody you know well and you can recognize their face, like Alois, whenever she came to see me, you, you, you're really living in a, in, in a bubble. Uh, and this extends to even your healthcare workers. Uh, many of the senior consultants because of the risks that they have because of age and comorbidities. Actually, they are your doctors, but you never see them because it is the young uh, medical officers and all that will come and examine you and what have you and all that. So it is a lonely disease. And, and I think that is something that we need to internalize as healthcare workers and therefore uh, you know, support patients in whatever way we can. Uh, the 15 days I was in the ward, again, I was lucky that being who I was. So on one day, one of my children, a daughter who is a doctor, was allowed to wear the PPE and walk in. And you guys, I can tell you, it made a whole world of difference. The fact that somebody from my family, a loved one, was standing next to me and I could hear her voice. So it is a very important thing. The second point I want to make is that COVID is a very expensive disease. The, the fact that all the healthcare workers have to you know, wear their protection as they come to see you, uh, the drugs are expensive. I, I think I can reveal this because it is me who you know, would decide whether to reveal it or not. For example, I received uh, the monoclonal antibody, tocilizumab. One dose is close to 300,000 shillings. Uh, if you are in a critical care unit in, if you like a high-end private facility in this town, just staying in that unit overnight is something in the range of about 30,000 shillings. So it is a very expensive illness. So I think that is also something that has a, as the uh, medical community, we should be cognizant of, because this also plays into the psychology of the patients, of the family, and all that. So that I wanted to add that before 
I answer Lois' last question, which is what happens? I mean, as many of you know, the course is quite variable. Uh, those of you who follow sports stars, for example, you hear this guy has been isolated with COVID and uh, two weeks later, the guy is playing football or basketball or tennis and all that. Uh, and of course, uh, younger people are at higher, le less risk, <coughs> excuse me, of, 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 of uh, serious disease so they recover easier. Uh, in my particular circumstances, one of the things that happened while I was in hostel was quite considerable loss of weight. I think I lost about you know, 10 kilograms in a two week period, which is quite, you know, quite remarkable. I also had very mm -hmm. severe, you know, um, uh, loss of appetite. Incidentally, the loss of taste and the loss of smell that is quite common, I didn't experience that. So what are some of the symptoms that I've experienced after I came out? One is a lingering fatigue. You feel completely okay at rest. And then you want to do something and you know, you don't live your life thinking I'm a sick person, you think you're okay. So you, you attempt to do it in the way that you've done it always. And then you realize there's some limitation in what you can do. So that can be quite frustrating. Uh, the other persistence of symptom I've had probably reflecting the, the extent of pulmonary involvement that, that I had is that I can't quite as yet, I hope I'm getting there, I can't quite exercise to the extent that I've been doing before. It was quite frustrating at the beginning. I think it's improving now. I mean, uh, a few days ago, I did like a whole 30 minutes at moderate pace walking. So hopefully I'm getting there. So that's, that's, that, that, that really is. The other thing that I've had is uh, a sort of persisting irritation in I can't quite figure out whether it is in the chest or the throat, honestly, but it, it makes me cough once in a while. It's a mild cough. I cough once and it goes. So there's that uh, thing that, you know, you can, after recovering from the acute infection, there are some of these symptoms that can persist. And as you know, from your experience and readings, it varies from person to person. Um, thank you so much, Professor Gola. Uh, just talking with Mehibet and saying you've come out looking younger than, than pre-COVID. <laughs> so maybe the loss of weight helped. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing your experience. We celebrate you for even uh, educating us on this, and uh, of course, we are very, very grateful to God for bringing you through that. And now that you're well and going back to everything that you used to do before, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to all the colleagues and, uh, you know, patients and their families and all that who prayed while I was in hostel. And thank you, especially Lois, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so now we're just coming up to the end of our session. Uh, but we have Dr. Maritim with us. There have been so many questions. I think half the night, the WhatsApp messages flying all over Nairobi and Kenya around, you know, the, the news around some of the countries um, uh, suspending uh, vaccination, the AstraZeneca vaccine, around some of the reports of some um, some symptoms that have been noted that may or may not be related to the vaccine. And I guess we just wanted to have a comment on vaccine safety. Is this vaccine safe? How do we assess safety? How do we determine all these things that are being thrown at us, whether they make sense or not? The best one that I had was about someone who had blurring of vision when they left the unit. And they started thinking it's because of the vaccine, only to realize they'd forgotten their glasses at the vaccination unit. I wish all stories were just like that. <laughs> but the doctor writing terrible. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Lois. And uh, I'm really happy to be on this panel today as we mark uh, one year since we had uh, COVID uh, disease in, in our country. And we know that the, the future is still uh, difficult, but we are very grateful that at this one year mark, we have the vaccine as part of our momentarium to really prevent uh, COVID disease. So looking at the vaccine and the question uh, that is at everyone's lips is about the safety. 
and uh, the concern. And we had uh, Linus uh, talking about the role uh, of the media in terms of passing uh, the correct uh, message there. But we know it's a big battle between um, the, the, the formal media and social media. And at this point, the social media seems to be winning because there are so many videos uh, doing the round. So the first question really is about the safety of this vaccine. And uh, I'm very uh, fortunate to have been one of the first recipients of this vaccine on day one. So really for me, uh, the question of safety, um, I'm convinced by the data that this vaccine um, is fairly safe. And when you look at the vaccine, we have to weigh the balance between the natural immunity that may be accrued from getting the disease vis-a-vis -vis the immunity that we develop after being inoculated with uh, the vaccine uh, against the disease. So looking at the two uh, aspects and because we know the risks that can come with acquisition of COVID-19 naturally, then it's safer to receive the vaccine because from already evidence that we have from clinical trials suggest that the vaccine is safe and even the efficacy data uh, also suggests that it's efficacious. So we know that it will offer us uh, protection within the, uh, once we receive it. Having said that, we know that vaccines work by inducing an immune response in the body. And basically one of, uh, some of the markers of this immune response for all of us who've gone through uh, pathology, we know about the pain, the swelling, the redness, you know, the fever, the loss of function. So those are some of the signs that we look for. Some of this may be local at the site where the vaccine is administered, but we may also have systemic side effects. And we've seen in various WhatsApp groups, some people uh, have shared how their experience was after receiving uh, the vaccine. So we classify um, vaccine reactions as minor, some as severe, and some as serious. And for the serious um, immune reactions, these are the ones that lead to um, hospitalization, they lead to uh, loss of life in some cases. Uh, so they're very threshold, but the ones that we consider serious uh, that are looked out for, especially in clinical trials, and even when a vaccine is introduced within a certain jurisdiction, the serious ones are the extreme where they result in death. They would result in uh, hospitalization of the patient. They would also result in uh, persistent or significant disability. Some of them may be life threatening. And in some cases, even uh, when you, um, vaccinate pregnant women and they develop congenital malformations in their newborn babies, then that would be considered as serious. For the current vaccine that we're using in Kenya, AstraZeneca, the safety data that we have just classifies most of the vaccine reactions as being uh, minor uh, reactions. And we actually have a list and these are communicated to us even when at the point when we are receiving uh, the vaccine. So some of the ones that have been are fairly common include uh, development of headache, nausea, fatigue, myalgia, uh, pain at the injection site, warmth of the hand, uh, redness. Sometimes you can even have itching. You can have some redness over that area. The next category is vomiting, which is a bit uh, much rarer, but the rarest are the ones now that would lead to decrease in appetite, lymphadenopathy, dizziness, abdominal pain, excess sweating, pruritus, and rash. So when you are vaccinated, some of these effects occur within three days. And there's a form that has been developed or you can return to the facility and report uh, some of the side effects that you've developed uh, following vaccination. So that is uh, data. The, the first set of uh, uh, reactions that I've talked about, they are called adverse events following immunization. However, an adverse event following immunization is any unexpected occurrence and sometimes the vaccine may not know whether it is um, related to the vaccine or not. So therefore it's important for all of us to report any of these side effects because somebody can receive the vaccine and then when they are leaving uh, their vaccination point, they can be crushed by a boda boda and that also has to be reported. However, there's a process to adjudicate and find out whether there's a causal link between receiving the vaccine and having the boda boda. Uh, accident. So there's, these uh, reactions have been predicted from safety data that were uh, generated to link, during the clinical trials. However, there's another category of um, adverse events that we don't often talk about. And this is a list of category of adverse events. And the reason I'm saying this is because the, what was uh, in the media yesterday, 
may fall within this category. So there's a category that's called adverse events of special interest. And these are events that were not really seen within the clinical trials. However, they may be related to, uh, they may have been seen in increased uh, prevalence or increased amounts related to the disease of interest. In this case, some of these events have been uh, uh, described and reported on to be increased with COVID-19 as a disease. And this one of these is uh, blood clots. We know that COVID-19 uh, in patients who have severe illness and patients who go on to develop critical illness, the risk of developing clots uh, in their blood system is fairly high. So deep venous thrombosis, clots within the arterial system has been noted to be high in COVID-19. And that is why as part of management, all patients uh, uh, receive anticoagulant therapy to minimize that risk. So within the literature, the pre-specified events that fall under adverse events of special interest, we abbreviated as IAC. It's pre-specified, and this is mainly pre-specified at the time of clinical trials, and even when the vaccines are rolled out, as has been the case under emergency use authorization. So there's a list of these events that are being looked out for to try and see whether there may be a causal link between the vaccine or the disease that is being protected by the vaccine and the development of those events. So having said that, if any of these events are noted, uh, you have to compare, to make a comparison and note, are these events necessarily increased uh, by vaccination compared to how they would be under normal circumstances, what we'll call the background rates? What would be the background rates of blood clots within a certain geographical areas? For example, in the case of Kenya, what would be the number of clots occurring uh, before COVID-19, during COVID-19, and then even with introduction of COVID-19 uh, vaccines like we've rolled out. So once all this data is generated, there's actually a process. So the first process, once somebody has an adverse event, it has to be reported and it's reported through the pharmacy and poisons uh, portal. All this data then is collated together. There will be some investigations that are done to try and really ascertain uh, the events and document what are the batch numbers of the vaccines that were issued, or was there a delay in administering the vaccine, did the vaccine stay outside for much longer than is what is uh, recommended by the manufacturer. So you try to look for a lot of information to try and find out what is really uh, the, the type of uh, adverse event following immunization because we have five types and I'll just remind us uh, what are these uh, five types. So. The five types, just to mention uh, briefly, the first type is related, is a vaccine product related reaction. So it's related to the vaccine itself. Then the second uh, type of reaction is what is called vaccine quality defect related reaction. And this is related to the manufacturing process. If something happened during the manufacturing process, it can interfere and thereafter manifest an ad as an adverse event following immunization. The third and most commonest form is immunization error related reaction. And these are mainly related to how the vaccine is managed at the time of administration. So some people, one of this uh, category of, uh, of this adverse event would be development of an abscess, for example, because maybe the vaccine stayed out for too long. So the type three is normally putting more money to be able to adhere to the manufacturers and best practices so that to minimize this type. Type four is what is called immunization anxiety related reaction. And an example of this is when uh, we saw adolescent girls receiving HPV and some of them would even faint on the queue before receiving the vaccine just because of the anxiety. The last type is what is called coincidental. And this is, there is no causal relationship and classifying these types help, help really to try and, and, and see where the gaps could have been. Uh, related to products or the process or the immunization process or any coincidental. So when an adverse event happens, like it was described in Europe with the blood clots, what was noted is that there were about 22 cases of uh, recipients of vaccine who went on to develop clots. But when this was uh, compared to the general population, there seemed, uh, it, at that point, it sounded like 22 cases were very high and they had all received the same uh, vaccine. However, when the background rate was compared, it didn't seem, it didn't, 
it didn't seem uh, particularly to be higher uh, than the general uh, rate. However, this, uh, the investigations are still ongoing and we await uh, the final uh, conclusion. So when somebody develops an adverse event following immunization or, or an adverse event or special interest, there's wow. actually a process that is followed that include investigation, collection of data, generation of reports, um, that then leads to the next step, which is to assess causality and see whether this reaction can be classified in any of those uh, five categories. However, we have to note that because these vaccines are fairly new, uh, some of uh, these adverse events of special interest are pre-specified because they could form signals that need to be evaluated. And we have to remember in clinical trials, people who received the vaccines were maybe 30,000, 40,000, 60,000. Now globally, about 300,000 um, doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered. And therefore the population is much larger. And some of these uh, things that could not be seen in the clinical trials, because we are giving the vaccine to a larger population, the effects may be magnified. And that's why we watch out for any safety concern, any safety signals that may uh, require further investigation. So just to conclude, we should not be too uh, worried. The data that we have so far regarding the AstraZeneca vaccine is, suggests that the vaccine is fairly safe. And just to clarify, we have two uh, types of AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, not really two, okay, it's the same vaccine, but two manufacturers uh, mainly. We have SK Bio, uh, where these uh, vaccines uh, that were supplied to Europe came from. And then we have the Serum Institute of India, where most of our African vaccines have come from. So, so far, uh, this has not been noted with the uh, Serum Institute vaccines. But as I say, we watch this space and we will definitely uh, report all the adverse events. We encourage all of you to report any of uh, uh, symptoms that you develop after receiving the vaccine so that we can contribute to our local data as well as even the global uh, data and to really help uh, as we roll out the vaccine. But to allay the anxiety, um, if you develop some of these side uh, effects, it doesn't mean uh, that the vaccine is harmful to you. If, even if you don't develop them, like myself, I didn't have many uh, side effects. So my concern was even, is the vaccine really working in my body? Because I was expecting to feel some fever and some of these side effects. But again, there's individual, uh, individual uh, body response that really determines how your body handles uh, the vaccine when it's administered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maite, for a really excellent overview of issues around side effects. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, I am. <laughs> Sorry, we're trying to love. So thank you very much for that. I think um, it, we're just coming to the very top of the hour and we'll be finishing in the next very few minutes. There are a few questions that have been asked. I think maybe I'll take one of them and I'll ask Dr. Maitim to answer the other one. We'll just try and answer very briefly. So one was interesting because somebody asked now, I, and this was for Prof. Gola, it's a discussion we've had with him actually, so I'll try and just uh, answer it very quickly. One, now that he received a monoclonal antibody, when should he get a vaccine? And there has been some, uh, there isn't data, but there's been some suggestion that monoclonal antibodies may undermine the effect of a vaccine. Because you see, if you're going to produce some protein and the monoclonal antibody is going to deal with it, then you may not really develop an immune response per se. But the guidance given from different groups seems to be that 90 days is probably sufficient time for you to have clear these monoclonal antibodies and to get the vaccine. So for those who've received a vaccine, a monoclonal antibody would uh, advise waiting for 90 days before the vaccine. So Prof uh, is waiting probably till around the end of March or uh, mid-March before he can get his vaccine. Uh, the other question is around pregnancy. Uh, is the vaccine safe in pregnancy, Dr. Maritim? Thank you. So the data, so the data that, we that we currently have, have uh, getting, getting the vaccines, the vaccines and pregnancy, uh, we, we don't have, have a lot of data. data. And, and I've seen, seen uh, for, for example, the mRNA, mRNA vaccine, vaccine there's already been a clinical trial targeting uh, or recruiting um, pregnant women pregnant women um, to be included in, uh, in the vaccine. Having said uh, that, knowing the construct of the vaccine and um, 
the, the, the benefits that the vaccine accrue. I think we should, if you're pregnant and uh, are willing to receive the vaccine, you should go ahead and receive the vaccine. And particularly for pregnant women, we would need to weigh the risk, especially in our setting where they, we have a third wave that's ongoing. The risk of uh, getting COVID during pregnancy would be much higher, particularly if you are a frontline healthcare worker, compared to if, for example, uh, the number of cases were low within um, within a jurisdiction, like in our case now, where we have the cases going up. Having said that, I think uh, because we don't have um, a lot of data, it would be safer to receive the vaccine outside of the first pregnancy, because we know a lot of teratogenicity that occurs occurs in the first uh, eight weeks. So if someone is pregnant and they have concerns about receiving the vaccine, weighing the current situation, they can uh, receive the vaccine. In our uh, training material for the vaccine rollout, uh, the vaccine, the pregnancy is not considered a contraindication, but it's a precaution. But there's, when you read the, the inserts uh, from the manufacturers, they say, discuss with your healthcare provider. So as a healthcare provider, um, who many of you um, have called and tried to discuss with me, I would recommend vaccination, but we would watch you, follow you up and see um, the outcome of that pregnancy because we have to weigh the benefits uh, versus the risk. But if someone is in the first uh, trimester, we may need to delay until uh, you're in the second trimester uh, to allow for organogenesis within um, the first trimester. Thank you very much, Dr. Maritim. I think that answer also applies to another question that's been asked. Around breastfeeding women. Again, there's limit as uh, using that same principle at this point of toxicity to the newborn, especially or to the fetus or the infant, especially because you know the vaccine does not cause infection. So we do not expect any harm to the uh, unborn child. Uh, for that reason, again, this is a discussion that uh, it's good to have with a woman who's breastfeeding. Again, to just think about what their risk is and whether they can have the vaccine. There's no clear reason why it's a contraindication, or it should be a contraindication. But as I said again, and as Dr. Martin said, there's very little data around these areas. And where you have women who are pregnant or breastfeeding who get the vaccine, it's important that that data is tracked so that we can build um, some data to inform uh, even future practice. Can you still contract COVID-19 if you have the vaccine? Remember uh, the efficacy that we're looking at for the vaccine was in preventing disease, okay? Most of the vaccines have been around preventing severe disease and preventing disease, actually prevents contracting uh, the virus. It seems that you may still be able to get virus, but you will not develop the disease. Okay, because of time, we really have to stop here. Very many interesting questions still come in. Send them in and we'll try to handle some of them at the next webinar. Uh, before we finish, I want to invite Dr. Kinothia, who has a very interesting poll that he'd want us to take. This will only take a couple of minutes. Please hold on for a couple of minutes. Uh, Dr. Kinothia, you're there? Yes, uh, Lois. Actually, I've already sent it out. It should already be appearing. And I can see. Ah, so we just answer yes. this, whatever we are. Yes, yes. I, I can already okay. see some responses. Jibuni. Yes, yeah. Quickly, quickly. How come I can't answer? It's not so, appearing for oh. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kiruthia, panelists are complaining. No? I, I included the panelists. I don't know what happened. I included. I've actually seen it myself and answered. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope you can also see the results as they are coming in. Lois, you'll tell us when to stop. I can stop at any point.
You're not seeing. Lois, can I stop? Or I give it one I more? can see the ones Maybe. who are not voting. No. <laughs> yeah. I want not to. <laughs> Please vote. We cannot see the results. Or is it just uh, the panelists uh, who are able to see the results? Oh, I can see them on my side. I, I am I not able to I'm... see. Oh. I am not sure how to make them available to everyone, but they are showing on our side. And uh, Dr. Mari team, 70% of people are, at the moment are saying they have concerns. So you still have a lot more to do. Yeah, we will work on to address their concerns. Yes. I'll stop in the next 15 seconds so that uh, we can end the meeting. That um, we really do not have uh, data to um, that indicates there is concern uh, in taking this uh, vaccine when one is uh, pregnant, but uh, gave caution that uh, uh, one should not take it uh, during the first trimester. Uh, of pregnancy. But remember uh, the uh, female uh, population that is in the reproductive age can actually have uh, the vaccine today and they become pregnant the same night. <laughs> okay, so do we have uh, a way in which uh, these uh, clients can be advised to probably, uh, in case they detect that they are pregnant, they can um, request to be monitored? How are we able to capture that's that data? So that's a very valid um, question. And I don't have an answer um, at the moment, but I'm hoping at least we can develop maybe a, a registry, maybe a pregnancy registry and uh, follow up people who report pregnancy after shortly after receiving uh, the vaccine. So I'm not sure, maybe when we have uh, the next webinar, we can include someone maybe from uh, the pharmacovigilance team to just uh, give us a sense of whether this has, is being considered, uh, like we did for one of the antiretroviral uh, drugs, dolutegravir, where um, there, were, there had been concerns about the effects on pregnancy. And therefore, there was a, a, a data, an active process to try and actually identify women who had received and thereafter become pregnant to monitor them for uh, the outcome of their pregnancy. So that's an important uh, addition. Is, is it possible that uh, this is also um, information that uh, we can capture uh, in our ANC um, setups, the antenatal clinics, so that uh, we have a, a, a question within the registration form where you are seeking information as to whether the mother received uh, the vaccine and if so, when? Yeah, because we can also uh, use that forum, yeah. That's a good uh, suggestion, uh, capturing that. And particularly because for the phases that are planned within the country, we are targeting very select uh, group of people. So that can actually be uh, included because we are uh, in the phase one, we are looking at healthcare workers and other frontline workers. And then phase two is potentially an older population that may be in the outside of the reproductive age group. But for the first phase, it would be important to add that so that this is an active question that, as, that is asked to uh, anyone, uh, who, like someone who presents in antenatal clinic um, who may have received the COVID vaccine and then they are followed up maybe in a special clinic or they are followed up actively to just monitor for any uh, outcomes and the pregnancy outcomes. Um. Just a quick question. In um, this Prof Ngwati, we're using this the Chanjo uh, WhatsApp to get in touch with everybody who's been uh, 
who's gotten the COVID vaccine. Maybe we can use the same platform to just ask the question about uh, potential adverse events or even that pregnancy. Uh, that way, you uh, you you maybe you have more data and uh, which can be uh, analyzed and give a clear picture. I also want to say Thank that I'm, yeah, I was just going to say yeah, to encourage. Though, I was also going to say to encourage those who are in doubt. Um, that I have taken the vaccine. I had a sore arm. I had a bit of a headache for a day or two. Not very different from when babies get their DPT vaccine. So I took paracetamol and here I am three, four days later and I'm fine. So um, uh, please, please, let's take this vaccine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof Ndwati, for those uh, very useful comments. Uh, the Chanjo uh, app is capturing a lot of detail. What I haven't seen is whether there's a self-reporting for pharmacovigilance within the app or the, the healthcare worker or the recipient has to physically present at the facility. I think it may be useful to have self-reporting where people can even report remotely because the visit to the facility may now be a deterrent because people develop the symptoms maybe a few days after and they, they are short-lived and they can, they can easily forget once they've recovered. So I think having uh, a form like the one that has been shared within our WhatsApp group as KNH uh, is important. Uh, but I've seen Christabel from PPB has put up her hand, and I'm hoping we can maybe give a, a chance to mention about the pharmacopoeia. Okay. So maybe Christabel, if you're there, just one minute. This is the very last um, comment that we'll have. Christabel, are you there? Uh, Chris, Dr. Christabel Kaimba, or oh, she's not a panelist, is she? Uh, so just one second. Meanwhile, um, uh, at least a few people have received the vaccine, and even though many have concerns, Hello. at least majority Hello. still plan to have. Yes, Dr. Christabel, just one minute if you make your comment, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was just commenting on what Prof Ndwati said. So the e Chanjo actually has a place where they can still monitor the events, though it's not as comprehensive. And just to add on to what uh, Marie Tim has said, uh, we're still allowing for people to do self-reporting because uh, it will capture more information. And um, on the issue that uh, Professor Guantai mentioned, we are planning to do to pick some facilities and just do targeted uh, spontaneous reporting. And one of the key interests is to find out if there's anyone who will be exposed to the vaccine if they are pregnant and then see what, uh, what else can be picked from there. So those are good points that have been raised and we are actually thinking about them. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Christabel. I think there's still so much for us to discuss. And just one thing, remember that only less than maybe 5,000 people have been vaccinated so far. Uh, we heard the other day that it will not be until maybe another two years that we'll have vaccinated about 30% of our population. So the vaccine is unlikely to make a big impact on our current outbreak. We have to go out and ask people to continue with many of the measures that need to be put in place if we are to turn the tide on the current wave. People have to wear their masks. People have to avoid gatherings. We really must talk about avoiding gatherings uh, within all our circles of influence because that's the only way we'll do anything about this current wave, even as we wait for a sufficient proportion of the population to be vaccinated. So thank you all. Many thanks to all the panelists for excellent uh, presentations, excellent discussion. And we look forward to seeing you in another two weeks when we have the next webinar. Um, I don't know, can, they, can you all see the poll or it's only us who can see the poll? So 13% of those who responded, which is close to 600, have received the vaccine. 82% plan to receive the vaccine. 71% uh, have some concerns regarding the vaccine. So uh, as we said, over time, we'll try and talk about the various concerns. 
and see if we can, you know, learn together along this journey. So have a good weekend, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.